Welcome to the 25th meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2018. Uh, can I ask everyone in the room please to ensure that your mobile phones are on silent. Uh, while you may use mob mobile devices for social media, please do not record or uh, photograph the proceedings. Apologies have been received this morning from Miles Briggs. The first item on our agenda is the final evidence session on stage one of the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Bill. And I'm delighted to welcome to the committee for the first time uh, in this role, the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport, Jean Freeman, who is accompanied by Fiona McQueen, Chief Nursing Officer, Diane Murray, Associate Chief Nursing Officer, Louise Kay from the Safe Staffing Bill, the Safe Staffing Bill Team Leader, and Elsa Garland, uh, Principal Legal Officer. So welcome uh, uh, to you all, and can I invite Jean Freeman to make an opening statement? Thank you very much, convener, and my thanks for the opportunity to be here this morning to talk about the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Bill and to answer your questions. The aim of the bill is to provide a statutory basis for the provision of appropriate staffing in health and social care settings. That matters because in our NHS, we focus all our work on meeting what is called the triple aim, that healthcare is safe, effective and person-centred. And all the evidence tells us that provision of high quality care requires the right people in the right place with the right skills at the right time to ensure the best health and care outcomes for those who need our services. Our policy intention with this bill is to enable a rigorous evidence-based approach to decision-making on staffing that ensures it is safe and effective, takes account of patient and service users' health and care needs, assists the exercise of professional judgment and pr promotes a safe environment. Providing that needs, means that we need to understand the workload that is generated in any given setting and circumstance and therefore the skills required and the staff mix that will provide these. My intention is that this bill will put in place a framework to support the sy systematic identification of the workload needed to improve outcomes and deliver high quality care. I know that each and every profession contributes to the delivery of positive outcomes for service users. That is why I've taken the decision to apply this legislation across all staff groups delivering health and social care services. In taking this broader approach, the bill achieves legislative coherence across the health and social care landscape, coherence that is demanded by the integrated health and social care approach that we are taking, which itself rests on the important recognition of value across all staff groups. Providing that assurance for staff and service users is, I believe, the right thing to do. We have the advantage in taking this approach across health and care services because we learned from the existing workload tools and methodology developed for nurses and midwives. The development of these tools has been an innovative, evidence-based and importantly, professionally led approach. This has led to their use in the Welsh legislation on safe staffing and in the development of workload tools used by NHS England. But even starting from that positive position, it is not my intention that the current suite of tools will remain unchanged. It is imperative that they continue to be reviewed and renewed to effectively support multidisciplinary approaches to the delivery of care. So the tools are important, but they are only one part of a much broader common staffing methodology and requirements that this bill sets out. The bill puts in place a process which should be applied consistently across health and social care. It ensures that we are using an evidence base to assess the workload staff are facing and moving away from a reliance on subjective assessments. But, and this is critically important, this is combined with staff using their professional judgment to tailor these assessments of workload to reflect the dynamics of their service and to take their local context into account when deciding how to staff services to deliver the high quality. That local context will fluctuate and requires a common, consistent workload and staffing methodology and link training so that staff are equipped with the skills to make these assessments. This will, I believe, have a positive impact on staff, on services, and importantly, on the care provided. Health boards, care service providers and their staff 
have the shared responsibility to openly and transparently determine how best to ensure we continue to provide safe and effective services. I would expect to see adjustments made on a real-time basis to take account of changes in workload and more appropriate a movement of staff to more effectively acknowledge the acuity and dependence of service users. Substantive posts used rather than bank and agency staffing. Staff understanding how staffing numbers were decided, staff having the knowledge of how to raise concerns, and staff having confidence that their concerns will be dealt with appropriately. The Bill does not explicitly define outcomes, nor should it. Our health and care standards and quality measures already define the outcomes we want to see. In addition to these improvements, the effective application of this legislation will support the wider workforce planning process. If services can clearly identify the workload required to meet the needs of the service users, it will be easier for them to workforce plan based on this evidence. And when local workforce plans are based on better evidence, provided by the consistent application of a common methodology, we will have more robust information to inform national workforce planning and supply. Convener, we have listened carefully to those who deliver the services in developing the Bill's provisions. We have listened carefully to the previous evidence sessions that you have held, and we will continue to engage with stakeholders and to consider their views. As always, I will give full and careful consideration to all proposals that come forward to strengthen and improve this legislation in the weeks ahead and to this committee's own carefully considered views. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary, and uh, that uh, uh, gives us a good opening for our discussion this morning. You talked about both the uh, placing in legislation of existing common staffing methods and also about uh, enabling better workforce planning methodologies to be developed. Would you regard one or other of these as the principal objective, or would you suggest that they are both of equal weight? I think they are, they are interlinked. Um, I think the, the common uh, methodology is critical, but so then are the tools to apply that uh, in order to um, understand what the workload is and what the skill mix is. Um, now, all of that, as I said, is important evidence and evidence base for making those assessments and decisions. But the critical importance is, of course, the application of professional judgment uh, to that. So I don't think you can strip out any area of this and still get as good a result as you will do if you put all of them together. One of the things that the committee has heard is the suggestion that these these. Uh, desirable developments, desirable though they may be, do not require legislation. Some of the, exist the existing tools, for example, have all been mandatory for the last five years. Is there any reason why you simply don't enforce that mandatory uh, provision in relation to health boards rather than uh, seeking to introduce primary legislation? Well, I think, if I'm right, as the committee will understand this from some of the information you yourself have gathered, is that whilst... Uh, these tools currently may be mandatory, the consistency of their application uh, is not present. And what we need to be able to do is ensure consistency of application, but not only in our uh, health settings, but also in social care. Um, it makes complete sense, given the direction of travel that we're on, which I, I think and I Hope, I'm sure committee members agree with me on this in terms of integrated health and social care as well as health care in uh, secondary and acute settings that we apply this methodology to determining workload and from that what is the right staffing mix to uh, meet that workload demand across all of those settings. To be able to do that requires, I believe, that statutory underpinning that ensures that there is that consistency of approach because there is a consistency of legislative requirement across uh, the relevant bodies to ensure that that is the way in which they work. The important part of all of this, of course, is its transparency. Um, some other colleagues here, I'm sure, um, with more recent experience of health than I have, uh, will nonetheless recall the days when um, ward charge nurses or sisters used to phone each other to swap staff around. 
Now, that may or may not have worked in those circumstances, but it was hardly described as transparent, and it wasn't necessarily a consistent assessment of workload based on an assessment of acuity, patient need, and so on. Having it in legislation means that everyone knows what is expected and how to apply it and how to make the decisions based on that. And importantly for us uh, at a government level, it gives us robust evidence, greater robust evidence, on which to do our workforce planning. Some of the evidence the committee has heard suggests that if there is an inconsistency in the application of the tools which are already mandatory, it may be because the tools are of different levels of value and usefulness uh, in the eyes of those the practitioners whose job it is to evaluate and, and apply them. And, and therefore the question would seem to be uh, one that perhaps might be addressed by management. In other words, if you've made it mandatory, it doesn't quite work for various reasons. Is that not a matter to resolve in discussion and uh, as a, in light of your management responsibilities rather than by creating a statutory basis for tools, some of which are clearly not 100% satisfactory in the eyes of those who apply them? Well, people may perceive uh, or may offer the argument that the tools weren't satisfactory and that's why I didn't use them. I, I don't have a great deal of patience with that myself, I have to say. Uh, it feels to me like a proxy for can you be bothered? Um, and that won't do. Um, where, there, where people have a genuine view that the tools require improvement, then there are plenty of opportunities to bring forward those propositions and seek with um, my colleagues here to make those improvements. And of course, the tools are uh, constantly reviewed and developed as we go along. I, I do believe that where while some, some requirement may be mandatory, um, it is not necessarily followed because other um, areas get in the way, other pressures may get in the way. I do believe that if we make this a statutory requirement, then everyone, including our health boards and the chairs who are directly accountable to me, will understand that they have an obligation to ensure that this is the approach that is taken consistently uh, across their boards and across uh, social care providers, but between boards as well. And that, I think, gives all of us a much sounder basis for making decisions around, based on workload, around what our workforce needs are and what the right skill mix is in any given circumstance. The other advantage, of course, of, of this approach, um, and this is a particular uh, facet of the tools themselves, is that capacity to be dynamic and to um, keep measuring in real time. Um, as we know, uh, circumstances in terms of, of the patient cohort you're dealing with or uh, the nature of your care home residents that you may be dealing with can change from, uh, in the case of uh, acute hospitals, from one day to the next to health and social care, perhaps from one week to the next. And you need to be able to flex your resource in order to meet that workload demand. Would it be fair to conclude that part, at least of the purpose of the bill, is to enforce uh, a, a mandatory approach which has not been properly applied thus far? Well, I think it would be fair to say that part of the purpose of the bill is to ensure we have a statutory framework that is well understood and therefore consistently applied across our health and social care settings. Thank you. Brief supplementary from Brian. Uh, thank, thank you, Vina, and uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary and the panel. Just to pick a point up there, uh, Cabinet Secretary, I think if you're going to have consistency, there is, we, we understand there's a lack of consistency in the application of the tools uh, across uh, different health boards, but if you're going to ensure that kind of consistency, surely then you have to uh, have to make sure there's consistency in, in dissemination uh, and implementation of training uh, across there. So rather than they kind of be bothered, it's more likely that uh, the training's not in place uh, uh, to make sure that, th that those, those, that those tools are delivered. So what's going to be different uh, if, you, if you're going to legislate and you're going to primary legislation in there, what is going to be different in terms of, of uh, how you're going to support that training and the dissemination of that information? I'm not sure. I, I completely accept your premise that where um, the current mandatory situation isn't applied, that will be because training isn't available. But I, I absolutely take your point that when this legislation is passed, should it be passed, then there is a, a requirement to ensure that it is rolled out in a consistent fashion with training. 
uh, and with support to staff and information for staff so they know how to uh, use the tools and apply the methodology and what to expect when others are doing that uh, and, uh, and demands are then placed on them as staff. And there is also a requirement to ensure that there is a consistency of monitoring to ensure that that is the, the work that is being done across health and social care settings. Um, the role of his in that uh, Health Improvement Scotland in that regard is critical, as is the role of NES, our education uh, body, to make sure that we have a consistent planned programme of rollout and training that is continuous uh, as new staff come on board that we're able to um, meet uh, their training needs as well. And that would be covered in the guidance that goes uh, with the bill should it, it be passed and in the programme of work that um, the Chief Nursing Officer and colleagues would take forward. Okay. Alec Cohan. You know, good morning, Cabinet Secretary, and good morning to your officials, colleagues as well. Um, one of the things this committee concerns itself with is barriers to integration. And I'm, I don't mean just the, the sort of meta definition of integration as it's defined in the Act, but a streamlined, integrated health and social care service throughout our country. And one of the things, uh, one of the concerns that's been raised in several evidence sessions is who this bill doesn't cover. And there are, for example, AHPs not covered in this bill and to certain aspects of social care, particularly care at home. Um, are we risking creating yet further silos by not including these other um, equally valid healthcare professionals and social care professionals in their setting of work? Um, thank you very much. I think you raise a really important point and um, I am very keen that we don't, uh, that not only do we break down some barriers that currently exist, that we certainly do not uh, in an unintended way or even in an intentional way create additional barriers and I understand the concerns that you're raising. Um, the, the view that we have taken, certainly, first of all I should say that in, in social care settings and I'm sure um, uh, Fiona may have something she wants to add to this. In social care settings, when the, the developed tool that will apply there uh, is worked through, then that will in many cases also include the skill sets that come from AHPs. So I don't think it's entirely um, accurate to say that they are excluded. Um, I think as you apply the um, assessment of workload and then look at what are the skill sets that are required to deliver against the, the detail of that workload, then AHPs in, in particular in some cases have a pretty critical role to play. So I believe they are covered in that way. Um, the point about um, care at home, I think, is a point well made. What we are trying to do, well, so what I'm, I am not saying is that over time, this approach would, not, would never apply in that setting. But I think... Bearing in mind, um, in part, Mr Whittle's, um, or what I believe would be the concern be on underlying his uh, particular question and some of the other issues that I know have been raised in committee, we want to take a stage and planned approach to this. Uh, and so moving into the whole health and social care setting, uh, into the setting of uh, care homes, where uh, the, unlike in the health setting, where uh, the bulk of that is provided by our National Health Service. In care homes, we have a large number of independent providers. Uh, we want to uh, properly engage them in the development of the method, a methodology and a set of tools that would be appropriate in their uh, setting and test that out in order to demonstrate the value of that to their work and to their provision of care. And then we would look to see if we can then move that once people... Uh, are uh, confident in the uh, approach that is being taken and can see its value. So at this point, I think it is arguably a step too far to include uh, care at home. Um, there are also other issues that need to be teased out around self-directed support and other questions that need properly thought through and teased out, and we need to ensure that stakeholders have the opportunity to bring forward um, the issues they want to raise there and work with us to resolve and to find a solution to that. So I think it, that is, in my opinion, the direction of travel, but I think it is too early at this point to put that into the primary legislation. 
And sh clearly, if that is a direction that we and others wanted to go down in due course, that would come forward as secondary legislation, appropriately so, so that Parliament could give it the right scrutiny at that stage. Thank you very much for that. Um, if I may ask then uh, about a slightly different area, um, the routing of these tools in statute uh, will ensure the uniform application um, of them across the health service and indeed the social care settings you describe. Um, to, to my mind, a tool is something that um, everyone decides is best practice and, and expects um, those at the front line to deploy. But we also know from our experience of other inquiries that, that actually best practice germinates from the grassroots up sometimes as well and that, that wards find better ways of doing things or adapting to the particular situation they face. How responsive will the toolkit be to to, um, to grassroots initiative to say we can do this better and we, we do it better and let's apply that across the board as well. So I'm going to um, pass at least part of your question, if you don't mind, to um, uh, the Chief Nursing Officer and the Associate uh, CNO uh, who have a greater understanding of the origins and the development of, uh, the, if you like, the core tools around nursing uh, than I certainly do. I, I would just make the point, though, before I do, that the tools are important, but the, that's not all this bill is about. Um, and the common staffing methodology is a critical element of this, of which the tools are a part. But in terms of um, the, the capacity and the flexibility for the tools to be developed and new ideas to come forward and so on and so forth, then I'd ask um, Ms McQueen, if I may, to respond. And indeed, I, th I think we've heard a lot from staff that talk about whether the, the tools are, are helpful or not. And some of that is perhaps a lack of understanding. Some of it is a lack of transparency about they, they do the work they, and then they think they're going to get more or different staff and it doesn't happen. So again, the transparency that will be outlined here will, will help support that. But I would absolutely expect the the professional judgment element of it. So if there are, are areas or ideas that the grassroots staff, the staff are delivering and who, who who know best how to deliver most effectively, then the professional the use of professional judgment should help and support that. And if there is something that's consistently no, I'm not going to say that, I'm going to say this, then that would through time be, be built in with the tool. So that may well be, uh, for instance, if we were looking at uh, acute medicine and at the moment that would just be in, in a medical ward, it would be a nursing tool. And the, the grassroots and the element from that would be, well, actually, the occupational therapist, the speech and language therapist, the, the physiotherapist are fundamental to quality of care and outcomes and safety. So they would then be, be involved in that as well. So ongoing openness, transparency, professional judgment and, and moving forward so that we're not... Uh, saying, well, we've developed this 18 years ago and that's going to continue for the next 18 years. So that that, that moving forward and, and having the constant review. But if I could perhaps, if, convener, if I could just give you a, an example of that. So yesterday, <laughs> I was fortunate enough to be in Aberdeen to open the first of our major trauma centres. And one of the distinctive features of the work that that entire Scottish Trauma Network has done is a recognition of the importance of uh, occupational and physiotherapy in uh, the rehabilitation of people who have suffered major trauma early, that bringing that in early, and psychological therapy. Now, they have built into their model uh, new posts uh, which uh, provide that and new posts which also provide a, a coordination and casework management function in that particular circumstance of high acuity and, uh, and trauma and so on. Um, intuitively, what they have done makes sense. It is certainly built on professional judgment, but there isn't a common methodology that lies underneath it that has taken them to that place. We are going to have four such centres. I would hope that we would see that learning picked up and used in those other three other centres, but what we don't have is a common basis on which to do it. So views may differ in other centres and someone may decide that that isn't something that's needed. Um, with, with this approach, then you have a much more solid basis for saying that isn't just intuitively the right thing to do, we have an evidence base that that's the right thing to do. Therefore, where we have a commonality of service, major trauma, 
then we would expect to see that range of skills uh, delivered by that different groups of professionals in order to meet the particular patient needs. Thank you, Camille. Emma Hartley. Thank you. It's just a uh, good morning. Thank you, convener. Good morning, everybody. I'm suggesting that the whole bill process itself it will allow the development of multidisciplinary tools, patient pathway centered tools itself, or a whole process where evidence will um, uh, evidence will be, uh, I guess, demonstrated. So that as you're describing, when the trauma centre in one place opens, and then you have a follow up that that way we can have a whole evidence-based approach to uh, uh, the whole system so that these tools can be developed, delivered, but in a way that works for care sector as well, which is really important, as well as acute care. So um, I, I'm, I guess I'm asking for an affirmation that this whole process in itself is allowing the development of an evidence base that can work across the whole health and social care sector. I think that's that's absolutely right, and importantly, it also contributes to the um, uh, increased robustness of workforce planning, um, both at a local level, but from local plans that are more robust and more evidence-based, then we clearly at a national level have uh, more robust and evidence-based data uh, collated so that we can do national workforce planning uh, with in increasing um, acuity. Uh, as we move forward. Yeah, and so, and in care homes itself or care in the community, I mean, that's um, the, the tools, there are no tools for that right now. So I'm assuming we'll be using the evidence from the nursing tools or acute care tools to help inform so that care homes won't be left behind in this process as we're moving forward. Yeah, again, I'm, I'm going to um, pass over to, um, to Diane, actually, in terms of some of the detail. But the important thing about care homes is the work that we um, in this ask the care inspectorate to do to enable right, uh, discussion with uh, those key stakeholders on the development of the tools so that they are appropriate for the care home setting. So it isn't a... It isn't a um, a rigid lift the nursing tools that, that work in the health setting and just apply them over. It is develop those in order to take account of the different circumstances in terms of the care home setting. But I'll ask um, Ms Murray, if I may, to give you a bit more detail on that. So that's absolutely right. It's about learning from the approach that we use to develop tools, but not simply importing what we've done for nursing and midwifery, say, within an, an acute adult setting. When tools are developed, they're developed with the people who know how to develop them, who know what the workload is like, who know what the work's like, what the patient pathway is like. So, so they would sit around a, a, a reference group and, and look to, to the particular models of care for that area. So as we, as we heard before, um, the care in a care home should be about um, everything around that patient's life and probably most importantly about making sure that they're as healthy and as well as they possibly can be and that they're enabled. So that would be something that was quite different. So in terms of that evidence, that's part of the evidence that we would be looking to. We would also look at care homes who actually deliver very, very, very successful models of care and understand what, what they have in those models. We would also look at research that there is out there um, in terms of uh, best provisions of care and best outcomes for people, where the best practice sits. And anything, uh, as we work up a tool, we would look at all of the acuity and the dependency around that. And in that setting, it's quite different. So it's not that it's not that acuity in terms of the very sick patient. It's the, cu the acuity in terms of how we need to support a person to stay as well and as healthy as possible. As they move through that and gather that evidence, they then work out what that workload looks like and what skills, knowledge and expertise are needed to put around that person to make that as successful as possible. That could be nursing, it could be AHP, it could be it could be in reach from a, um, from a district nursing team or an advanced nurse practitioner. But most importantly, it will be developed by the service for the service 
with the service, with the care inspectorate in a lead role, but working with their key partners uh, in terms of, of, of uh, SSSC, COSLA. We know that SSSC has a huge database in terms of the workforce information and the training, education and skills of that sector. So it would be very much based within that sector. We could find that actually the key skill that we really need within a care home setting is that of the occupational therapist, but it would be for that sector to do that themselves with support in terms of the methodology that we know works. Okay. Thank you very much. Cabinet Secretary, you've talked about some of the dynamic day-to-day -day staffing challenges that people face on ward. The, the bill clearly is designed to assist with establishment workforce planning, if you like, at a local level. Does it do anything at all for those dynamic decisions that need to be made on a day-to-day -day basis? Yes, I think it does, because I think the, by, um, by having a consistent methodology, uh, of which the tools are a part, and ensuring that through training and information and development that that is widely understood and is transparent, then that allows um, what my colleagues described to me earlier, t earlier is that by and large ac across our um, healthcare settings, our hospital settings, then every day there will be what, they give it different names, but generally speaking it's called a huddle. And that huddle could be at ward level, could be at um, uh, specialism level or whatever, where um, in the old days it was, it was the transfer of, of reports from the night shift to the day shift about what your patients were, how many you had and, and what was happening with each of them. It's a version of that done now, but it is also a place where people might be raising right now that they are uh, a short uh, in terms of a particular qualified nurse or a particular specialism. And that, that may well be recognised, but uh, they're asked to just accommodate that. What we would have in these circumstances is a situation where people are bringing to that the application of this approach with evidence about why they need a set of particular skills because the acuity uh, levels in their ward have changed and may have changed in a different way from someone else. That allows the uh, proper, proper deployment of staff between those two situations, if you like, in real time. And it allows it in a way that is much more transparent because everybody is working from the same starting point. Um, so it, the approach that we are uh, including in this bill is um, more uh, transparent, allows for better decision making, I believe, because it is evidence based, but with that application of professional judgment, and allows um, staff, senior staff, clinically led to flex the resources they have to meet any particular changing circumstance on a day to day basis. As we know, that happens a lot in our acute setting in particular. The evidence we've heard tends to suggest that the tools are helpful in determining those things from year to year, but not from day to day. So I'm interested in how the, the, the bill changes that provision in a way that makes, makes a difference. So what we will be doing, <coughs> you're absolutely right, there is the on an annual basis. And, and as we know, workload um, has, has peaks and troughs. So as part of this ongoing work, we will look at the whether you call it escalation or you know, dynamic risk assessment, then we will build in uh, quick, easy, but open, transparent ways of making sure that where staff have concerns that uh, care won't be delivered on that day-to-day -day basis, that that can be accommodated, it can be moved, but we would also expect the application of professional judgment to that. All of that will be reviewed um, in a, a systematic way, but we would be expecting that to be taken. Sometimes it is hour by hour, depending on, on, on what situation you have, but certainly shift by shift or, or section of day by section of day, so that we're, we are ensuring that we have a, a, a total comprehensive approach um, every day um, across our services, rather than once a year. Thank you very much. Uh, David Stewart. Uh, thank you, Commander. Uh, thank you uh, for coming along today, Cabinet Secretary, and uh, can I um, welcome your officials as well. And like many members, I've um, sat through all the evidence sessions and read all the consultation reports. And clearly, I think uh, everyone would agree that we want to see an improvement in, in quality and in staffing. 
I suppose the bit I struggle with, Cabinet Secretary, uh, and I'm very happy to listen to your views on this, is to see the real jump from what we have now to effectively a brave new world in, in the future, uh, that this bill will make a real substantial difference. So c can you perhaps outline what will the differences be in quality of care and the adequacy of staffing once this bill is approved? Uh, thank you for that. I'm, I should start by saying I'm not promising a brave new world. Um, and uh, even if I am, this bill in, of its own will not deliver it. Uh, but it will be an important part of getting to a situation where we have increasing confidence that our intention in terms of consistent quality of care um, is based on sound evidence uh, and is consistent across uh, across our health service. Now, our health service is uh, primarily a service delivered by people. And in those circumstances, as we all know, um, there will always be occasions where it is not perfect and uh, things don't work quite as planned. And there isn't a piece of legislation that I could possibly bring forward that would uh, ensure and guarantee that that would never happen. So there are a couple of clear caveats to put into this just on a common sense basis. However, what I do think the bill does is it provides, it provides two things. It provides a, for an approach that has been proven to work and to be effective, to be consistently applied across our, across our health se se service and to be translated and um, modified appropriately into our social care setting. Uh, which is, of course, the right thing to do because we are moving in strongly in the direction of health and social care integration. That consistency of application, and more importantly, the, the evidence that it produces, allows for decision-making to be uh, more clearly scrutinised and understood, both at a local level, be that the ward, the care home setting, or uh, at board level, or even nationally, to understand why... Uh, board X is coming and saying that it needs this number of nursing, this number of uh, AHPs. It wants to um, realign its skill mix in a particular area. It's got an evidence base for doing that that is consistent with the evidence base that Board Y might come forward with a different set of propositions that we can then better understand and is more transparent, having involved appropriately all the staff who should be involved, and it's not simply a management decision. So the whole approach is led by a, an increased understanding of workload, the workload that, that is produced as a consequence of patient or service user need. That workload itself then tells us what kind of staffing mix we ought to have. Uh, that is uh, transparent and open and therefore challengeable, uh, decisions that I might make or decisions that a, a charge nurse and a ward might make or a care home manager might make, challengeable, scrutinisable and evidence-based evidence that allows us to then say, as we go forward, these are our workforce needs now, but these are our workforce needs uh, in, the, in the next uh, years ahead. And that's produced directly from an understanding of what uh, service user and patient need produces by way of workload. I think that is a substantial difference uh, in terms of what this bill provides and a significantly important grounding for some of the work we need to do both nationally and of course at local level. Well thanks for that. You mentioned uh, transparency. Can I raise a further point uh, about transparency and empowerment of staff and indeed patients? Let me give you a practical example. Um, uh, if I raise uh, New Craig's in Venice, which I know fairly well, I know some staff that work there and in my previous life uh, I worked, uh, did my mental health officer training in the old New Craig's. Um, so I have some experience of that organisation. I know from personal experience of staff that work there, there is an absolute chronic staffing problem, which obviously I've raised uh, with Health Board and I've visited key, um, the key managers to discuss this. If the staff wish to complain about this issue, we have current procedures, what could they do in terms of Healthcare Improvement Scotland? You'll know from last week's evidence I asked uh, some of the key staff there about what, 
what would the new regime look like? So what would the mechanisms be for staff and for patients indeed if they were very unhappy about inadequate staffing in that establishment, just to give a practical example? So I think we've, we've yet, we would want to work with stakeholders to, to determine how we could do this most effectively because it is something that, that staff will tell us that um, they, they're not quite sure what to do or they put something into the incident reporting system and, and nothing happens or something happens in three months' time. So it's something we would want to work with stakeholders, uh, you know, the colleges, along with Healthcare Improvement Scotland and staff, uh, and you rightly say, uh, patients and service users, we would want to, to work with people so that we could get something that's meaningful, practical and, and makes a difference. Okay, good. Can I a final question? Um, can we... Right. Uh, can I just add to that that one of the things that the RCN have said uh, about the current draft legislation uh, is that they welcome the, the proposition in it around escalation. Um, now they obviously have a view about further strengthening of that and how, what that might look like, and we are certainly open to further discussion with them about how uh, those situations and the situation you've described in that circumstance, how staff can escalate that, um, where, they, where they believe that the concerns that they are raising around uh, st staffing levels to meet a workload demand uh, are not being uh, properly uh, listened to and what they might do as a consequence of that. So I think it's a, it's a very important point, uh, as is the point about, you know, as we raised earlier, about how we um, extend training and information and also how we ensure that what is in this legislation is actually implemented in a consistent way. And it's one that we will give some further thought to. I should have added, I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary, I would certainly like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to new Craigs in the future. I'm sure she's got a busy schedule uh, along with Fiona McQueen and her, and her colleagues. My final question really is looking at what we have currently and, and looking into the future. So, uh, so what recourse other than the Board's own complaint procedures could an individual pursue if there was a failure in service? And the Cabinet Secretary aware of the Royal College of Physicians' view that they don't feel that there's uh, a full transparency if the boards don't fulfil uh, the individual aspects of this bill. So uh, it's really two aspects. So what's new about this? So could, could you just give me a little bit more about what you're asking? Are you talking about an individual patient in terms of what they might do or a staff member and what they might do? Yes, both. Well, I was, I was lumping both together. I think okay. it's very important that we empower both uh, staff and indeed patients because clearly if there's a failure in equality of service or a failure in staffing, that's going to impact on the staffing and indeed uh, mm -hmm. on the quality mm -hmm. of the experience mm -hmm. that the patient will get. Mm -hmm. So this bill inserts into the 1978 Act, uh, so it becomes part of that, if you like. It's, it's linked to that Act. And that Act gives uh, a number of powers to ministers uh, that we can exercise, uh, which includes uh, direction, power of direction if we believe that a board is not meeting its statutory responsibilities uh, or is failing uh, to meet those adequately in some way. Now that is at the upper end of the scale, if you like. Uh, in, the, in the getting to that end, there are a number of steps. Patients obviously have the opportunity for uh, individual complaints complaints where they believe that the board has not fully addressed those complaints. We have uh, the Public Service Ombudsman uh, also there. Uh, we have uh, the importance of care opinion, I should say, um, whilst it carries no direct sanctions, it is certainly widely read uh, and used by our boards and uh, I review it regularly myself to see what people are actually saying about the care that they've received. In terms of staff, there is, of course, the formal grievance procedure. But in addition, as I said, I am uh, more than happy to consider anything that may come forward from the RCN or others around the escalation process. And in addition, we have the regular reviews that go on between my officials and boards, um, including the uh, work on the partnership forum, staff governance uh, and clinical review committees, and the annual review that uh, I and my colleague ministers conduct of board performance. So if boards, uh, as we've had in other examples where there's 
what I've described as a postcode lottery where there's provision of, say, for example, treatment in one area and not in another, it, that you would have more central control to ensure that the board does what's laid down in the Act? I currently do uh, pick up and pursue those uh, situations where uh, they're raised with me, um, where uh, an individual, for reasons that I, that I do not understand, often raised by yourself or your colleagues, uh, is not receiving uh, a treatment. Now, where there are clinical decisions, of course, that is something that no politician should uh, start guddling around in. Uh, Lord would help us if we ever did. But there are other circumstances where um, what I would expect a board to be doing is not necessarily being applied consistently, uh, either within that board area or between boards. And we do, in we do pursue those individual circumstances. Thank you very much. Look. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just on, on the same topic, in social care, if a provider is unable to comply with their new statutory requirements, what are the consequences there? Well, of course, the Care Inspectorate uh, has a number of powers uh, that they uh, can exercise and do, uh, including uh, looking to secure improvement and uh, giving and putting in place improvement notices right through to a situation where uh, they will go and seek a, a court uh, approved sanction to uh, close a, a care home down if they believe that the residents there are at risk uh, and we know that, that they do exercise those powers. Um, they would be um, exercising their um, inspections uh, on the basis of what is in this legislation should Parliament approve it. Sandra White. Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning to, to your officials. Uh, probably come back to slightly what uh, David Stewart had asked at the beginning, and possibly in a nutshell, what people have been asking me, and I hope you forgive me having listened to all the evidence. It's becoming clearer now to me, uh, basically, about what's happening with uh, not just obviously the tools, but how it is going to drift down into the care sector. And that's certainly something that's been raised uh, with me. So, I mean, I just want to know you mentioned the fact that, um, you know, secondary legislation and stuff will be translated and modified. I just wonder, is there a time scale where you think? that once the tools are in place, and obviously in the nursing and, and the, you know, the hospital setting level, is there a time scale when it will filter down to the healthcare situation? I mean, we've heard from evidence last week from AHPs, the trade unions and the care inspectorate that they're actually working together and they look forward to this coming in. Uh, they're working together at the moment, but nobody knows when the, if there is a certain time scale where this will actually go down to as somebody else had said, the grassroots level, which obviously I'm very interested in, integration, health boards, that type of thing, obviously it affects people in care homes. So I just wondered, do you envisage a certain time scale, or, or can you give us a time scale? Um, either or both of my colleagues may want to add uh, something to uh, what I'm about to say. Um, but, uh, but actually, the fact that those bodies, as you've described them, are working together and are looking forward to uh, this draft bill becoming legislation um, gives us a bit of a significant indicator about how quickly we should be able to manage this. So we are taking um, the proven evidence-based methodology used in nursing and midwifery and looking with their direct involvement and the involvement of the, the care inspector enabling that to happen to, uh, to take those tools and where, where they require modification for the care home setting, put that modification in place and do it in a way that involves uh, those organisations uh, that are active in the care home setting. Uh, as soon as that is achieved, then they will be applied. So in, in one sense, they are the masters of that timescale um, because they will be the ones directly involved in ensuring that what, is a, that what they are expected to do, that they have been directly involved in developing and designing that base, but they're starting from uh, a set of tools and a methodology that has already been proven to work in a particular setting and they will then look to how they apply it into the care home setting. That's the care home setting. That is not care at home. Um, and as I um, explained um, to Mr. Cole Hamilton, that is the direction that we would look to go in, but the bill doesn't cover that. 
um, rightly so, because we're not ready yet to move there. And should we get to that point where we are ready to move there, then that would appropriately come back as secondary legislation for Parliament to give it due scrutiny. I don't know if either of you want to add. There, there is a, a, we've increased the infrastructure around this um, as, as part of the development of the bill. And we have a process for the review and the maintenance of the current tools that we have and also for taking forward evidence where we feel the, that the development of new tools needs to go next. So the, the group is, there is a group working on that, a national group working on that to see where we, where we feel we should be going to, to next. And that group will bring forward um, proposals based on their um, intelligence of the, of the sectors that they're working with. But in terms of care homes right away, right away. and the other ones with due regard to uh, providers' need, etc. Um, Sorry, please, could I just yeah, yeah. just add as well to that? I mean, it partly is a, additional information in terms of, of your question, Ms White, but also Mr Whittles. If we look at the um, financial memorandum, then we will see in that the costs set out which cover um, the development of the tool, um, staff training, support for boards and for others in order to do this work. So we, we're planning all of that into uh, what we have before us. Thank you very much, because that was one of the issues I did raise about the financial memorandum previously, and I'm pleased to see it, it is there. Um, I'm assuming that uh, it is a moving feast, and there'll be checks and balances as it, as it moves along. Uh, so basically that'll be transparent for everyone to see. Because one of the issues that was raised by the trade unions was the varying um, local authorities and obviously it's not taken into account care at home. So that's something I'm presuming that you'll be looking at again. Can I just put perhaps uh, something into the mix or maybe take something out of the mix? Obviously there's Brexit coming up. We have an ageing workforce that was you know, given an evidence to us, particularly in care homes where they have perhaps uh, an older set of, of nursing, uh, basically, which are multifaceted. Uh, how is that going to affect this bill? Have you put that into consideration but from, for all the tools, particularly the Brexit situation in care homes and obviously, you know, having staff coming here? Well, I ideally wish that was something you could have taken out of the mix. That would have been uh, a significant help, I think, to all of us. Um, and unfortunately, you can't and neither can I. But equally, putting it into the mix is a bit difficult too because we do not know this, the circumstances that we'll be in. Um, it will undoubtedly be the case, though, that if we end up in a position um, where we have uh, fewer uh, EU nationals working in our health or care settings in Scotland, uh, and even worse, those who are currently here uh, no longer feel that, that it is where they want to remain, and return to uh, their home country, then what that produces for us is a significant difficulty in workforce numbers, um, which will be exposed in part by the application of uh, a methodology and a tools that looks to um, provide an evidence on workload demand. So it provides the evidence on workload demand. Professional judgment is then uh, used and applied to that. And that tells you what kind of skill mix you should have and where you should be getting that from. If you are then struggling, uh, in a sense, because uh, some of the, the individuals who may have provided that to us right now uh, and in the past are no longer here, then there is self-evidently a difficulty. Um, it is hard to uh, properly, in fact, I, th I do firmly believe, and I think it's worth saying, that no responsible government which would ever say that it is possible to completely mitigate all of these risks. But um, part of what we are doing is looking at how we, as, as uh, it's described, grow our own. So, for example, I was um, in Wishaw, last, Wishaw General last week, where they have... Um, developed, a, as Golden Jubilee have, their own theatre academy in order to upskill their nursing staff. So as, as the newly qualified trainees come out ready uh, from that 
significantly six year in a row increase in student trainee numbers that we um, are pursuing. Uh, as those new trainees come out, existing uh, staff can be upskilled um, to take on additional roles. Um, so that growing of our own, the work that is going on in terms of uh, our higher, further and higher education sector, looking at uh, articulation uh, between uh, uh, college-based uh, courses into, uh, for, uh, into higher education, uh, working with uh, young people uh, preparatory to leaving school so that they have some foundation level work for health and social care. All of that is about um, increasing the numbers of individuals uh, who will look to health and social care as an opportunity. Uh, and uh, last night, as it happens, I was at the Prince's Trust Awards where the Get Into Healthcare programme uh, not only produced a couple of award winners, but we were able to also talk about the new partnership with Prince's Trust that will give uh, health and social care opportunities to an additional 400 young people. Um, so all of that, there are a range of um, actions across not just my portfolio, but other portfolios in government looking to increase the opportunities and the throughput uh, from people, young people and others, returners, women returners uh, as well, into health and social care. Uh, all of that is the right thing to do. Will that mitigate uh, the difficulties that uh, whatever form Brexit takes, it will give us? No, it won't mitigate that completely. So there will be um, difficult decisions to make and issues to resolve once we know what we're dealing with. Just for the avoidance of doubt, there's nothing in the bill or in the financial memorandum to the bill that in any way helps employers faced with severe staff shortages, either in health or in care. Could I say something? Well, yes, absolutely. You can in just a <laughs> minute. <clears throat> the financial memorandum talks about the costs of implementing the bill. It does not appropriately talk about the cost of employing staff. Um, so no, there, there isn't um, in, in that circumstance. But Fiona, it's more about the, the. If I leave Brexit to one side, the, the older workers, Miss White rightly um, raised, and I think what this will do is again, if we listen to staff, they talk about workload and they talk about it being difficult. Now we know there's a real evidence base that meaningful, fulfilling work is good for one's health. So again, putting aside differences about the pension age, the reality is meaningful work is good for people's health. And what this will do is will make an appropriate assessment of workload so that no matter what age you are, <laughs> you should be able to come in and do your job and not be exhausted, but be fulfilled and, and take pleasure in it. I think we will also be able to look at how we support the older worker to continue to work. So I think... Um, well, the Cabinet Secretary, I think, has been very eloquent about a lot of the work that we're doing to, to widen access and to bring other people in. I think this will help. I would expect it to make a difference to our older workforce, to be able to keep them in employment because we are absolutely having safe and appropriate staffing that is commensurate with the workload that people are facing. Thank you. I was Brian going to apply for a job, but you're fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Whipple. Thank you, I think it's probably appropriate to just now I, I refer members to my register of interest here. And I'm still a, a, a director in a company developing communication and uh, collaboration uh, platform and tools, including for uh, healthcare uh, profession. Um, the SSTS uh, sits on or, or piggybacks on the, the back of um, the payroll platform. Um, which is not which is not unusual, but what that what that means is that we're basically bolting on software tools uh, onto a platform that wasn't initially designed uh, designed for that purpose. And I think it's been, and the evidence we've heard uh, so far that there, there has the the suitability of that platform going forward has been questioned has been questioned. So I, I think the, the, to start off, can I ask you know what what the sequence of events? That led the bill to legislate for the use of these for the tools that, in essence, as we've heard, are, are becoming outdated on potentially an unsuitable platform. Before procuring a new bespoke platform uh, and reviewing and developing then the, the sort of robust workable tools for that specific platform. Um, I'll let uh, Ms. Murray explain uh, or take you through some of the the detail in responding to your question. However, as as you know, 
um, Mr Whittle, one of the key bits of advice that Audit Scotland always give in terms of uh, IT and uh, IT platforms is, uh, if at all possible, do not build from scratch. Do not build brand new. Look at what you have and see how you can adapt that. What you have that works, see how you can adapt it. Look at what's on the shelf uh, and see, uh, again, uh, proven uh, workable platforms and see if that too can be adapted to meet uh, your existing needs. And if none of this works or if you're left with a gap, then you build from new. Uh, and so that is the approach that we take uh, in government. It's absolutely the approach I took in social security and it's the approach that I would take in health. In terms of the specific detail here, then I'd ask uh, Ms Murray to deal with that. Um, I think you're aware that the, the um, SSTX platform is, is, a, a, is a, our payment pla platform for NHS Scotland. And the tools were put onto that platform because it was the most appropriate place to put them at the time. And actually, um, when you know how to use uh, the the IT around them, and how to you know how, when you know how to put the information into SSTS, it's actually fairly simple. And I hope that that the team were able to show you that this morning. We are going out to procure an e-rostering system, as the as the committee are aware, and we will complete that by the end of this year. When we get that system in place, which will give us all of the um, real-time information in terms of our rosters, which fit into this approach, we will then take an on-balance view of where is the best place to situate the tools. Whether that continues to be on that platform or any new platform that is procured to undertake our um, payroll system, or whether it would be on um, any new platform that links with um, our um, electronic rostering but we need to really understand the capabilities of that before we move to do anything uh, like that the tools um, are capable of being revised and renewed as we move along the tools are capable of taking into the into um, consideration the context of the service in which they are provided the platform that they are on is a repository of that information and it does produce reports for us when we better understand that as well we, we will know where the best place to situate them is the the link has to be there between the electronic rostering system and the the tools platform and that's something that through that procurement exercise we will be absolutely clear about so that the systems can can talk and feed to each other and that work hasn't concluded yet so that's probably as as much as i can say about that but being sure about what we need on any it system is the first premise then it's actually the procurement of it. So understanding what we need is our first premise. Yeah. I, Cabinet Secretary, you're right, of course, you don't procure, you know, build from scratch if you can possibly avoid it. I think within this, this sector, there will undeniably be tools you can take or, or platform you can take off the shelf that can, at the very least can be adapted. I think the question, though, in, in terms of in developing tools that will, that will sit on the current platform Surely the best process then would be to understand the platform on which they sit prior to then procuring or developing tools because you will develop a different tool for, for a different platform without question. We will have to do both. We will have to do both. The, the tools, the, way that they, the ones that we have that sit on that platform sit there um, in the way that we intended them to sit. But if we develop something different, um, you're quite right, that may sit within an IGB setting, we have to consider that. So that's absolutely, th would need to be considered as part of this as well. So you're in, you're in a procurement loop at the moment, looking at the platform on which these new tools will sit? We're looking at the moment at the e-rostering platform, we will then take a decision as to whether we maintain on this site or we transfer over to that. As part of that procurement exercise, that's part of the questioning that will be asked in terms of the ability to feed our workload tools platform. Okay, thank you. Can I, can I just ask that uh, in the financial memorandum, it refers to the work of the nursing and midwifery work, work, workforce uh, and workload planning programme uh, in developing the new tools. So w will they be carrying out the work uh, for other NHS staff groups uh, and settings uh, as is indicated in the financial memorandum? 
I think um, we will, as we said before about the care home setting, we will use the learning from that, but that work can't take place in isolation of the staff that know how to undertake that work. So if we were thinking about a multi-professional tool, the group that would be bring together uh, around that would be a clinical reference group that includes all of the people who would actually be working on that, uh, working on the development of that tool. So it has to include more than just a uh, nursing, but the learning from it is, is the important part. That's learning which has been taken forward both in the Welsh legislation and also in uh, the tools that have been developed in uh, some of our English settings and in some of the multi-professional tools. So we know, that, we know that that learning is robust, but we need to bring the evidence from the other, um, from the other services and from the other professions into that process and not, um, not throw the, the baby out with the bathwater, but be able to, to change and adapt according to the requirements that we find. Just one more. I mean, we've, um, and, and with reference to sort of multidisciplinary teams and multidisciplinary tools, I mean, we have uh, in, in the evidence here had concerns from from uh, bodies like sort of allied healthcare professionals, suggesting that they that they feel they might be they might create a two tier system and they might be left behind. So within within that, uh, when when you envisage bringing them into the, the development of the tools? Well. As I said earlier, when, when you apply the tools, the, the developed tools, in terms of the care setting, then it is most likely, and it may even be in, in the hospital setting, that uh, as you look at the workload and you look at what is the right skill mix, then allied health professionals are the very people who have the skills that you are looking for to meet that particular need. So in developing... The, in the work that we've described earlier that the care inspectorate will enable in looking at how the current tools are modified and reviewed and applied to a care home setting, then we would expect to see the, a degree of expertise from allied health professionals being involved in that work to develop the tools that would be appropriate for a care home setting. Thank you very much. Keith Brown. Uh, can I um, say that I suppose listening to all the evidence sessions that we've had and being new to this committee, I've kind of um, got it in my mind now that this really is a bit like um, the police would have intelligence-led policing, which the Cabinet Secretary will know from one of our previous roles. It's the idea of um, being evidence-based but also allied to professional judgment. We did have um, evidence from uh, Unison in particular who were concerned about staffing, as you would expect them to be. I made the point then that I would have thought this would help in that regard because if you continue to apply the tools and the common methodology, then it would show up where there was a requirement for increased um, staffing. And I don't think they saw it that way, but that, that's the way I saw it. But um, Ms McQueen said at the start that sometimes the existing tools have been applied and that led to an expectation it would result in increased staffing and people being disappointed. Are you confident that was because the evidence showed that it wasn't required? And I suppose the other part of the question, do you think it, this is a, a tool which will help both um, providers and commissioners of health and care services to recognise when there is a need for increased staffing? Uh, the short answer to that is yes, and, and there are, are a couple of reasons for that. Um, first of all, I should let me just mention in passing the point I made earlier about escalation uh, and looking at how that works. Secondly, there is a point about um, when you have a consistent methodology that, that produces evidence of workload that you then apply um, professional judgment to, and you have that on a statutory basis with both um, Health Improvement Scotland and the Care Inspectorate required to take into account uh, looking at whether that has been applied properly and then acted on, then you diminish the, the opportunities for people to be disappointed because they believe they have produced evidence that they need a um, set of skills, why, and it didn't happen. And you increase the likelihood that those who made the decision not to respond positively to that evidence have that decision very uh, clearly scrutinised as to why did they not do that then when the evidence was there and the professional judgment was applied. Knowing that that is the basis on which you will be inspected, that is the basis on which improvement uh, notices will be uh, put on your service, uh, helps people 
to understand the importance of consistently applying not only the methodology and the tools, but acting on the results that that then gives you. So I do inspect it, expect it to be a um, significantly improved situation from the one we have now. Now, that does not mean that the passing of this legislation guarantees that staff won't be disappointed. Um, they may be disappointed because they may nonetheless feel that uh, the, the solution that was provided to them was not the one that they wanted. Um, as long as, as that solution can be um, defended in terms of the proper use of the evidence and the clinical judgment and the circumstances in which the local context, as I described it earlier, then that decision is fair. What is most important about it is that that decision is clearly set out and is understood. And that's my point about transparency. I think part of the disappointment, um, and if I cast my mind back um, in time, quite a long time, I can recall this, part of the disappointment is feeling that decisions were made and nobody ever really explained to you why they were made. So you didn't know why, why did Ward A get that extra pair of hands and my ward didn't, right? Was that just because the manager didn't like me or liked that or whatever? All sorts of different possibilities run through your mind when you don't know transparently and clearly what is the basis on which that decision was made. And one of the things that this legislation does, of course, is address that. David Torrance. Good morning, everybody. Um, you touched on it earlier, Cabinet Secretary, about flexibility. But does the bill allow for su sufficient flexibility for working change and um, technology change? And how quick can it react and implement it? In, in what sense? Changes to working pr process and things like that, and the technology and how it changes uh, staff yeah. members. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, th I think in terms of changing working practices, yes. absolutely. And I think going forwards, then when things change and the changes within healthcare delivery have been quite dramatic, quite remarkable over the past, say, 10 years. So there would be no point in saying, well, 10 years ago, this is the staffing you need, so that's that's what's going to continue. Sometimes that increased technology means that more complex care can be carried out and, and people are iller and frailer and need more staff. And sometimes that technology means no staff are needed because there's a technological solution. So that's why the, the consistent application of the tools, the routine and regular application, the professional judgment involving um, service users, patients' views, staff views in, in taking it forwards means that we will absolutely be able to embrace and we know that the future will be, be different in terms of taking this forward. So we would expect to see that, yes. Can I say thank you for that answer. The other thing is, uh, what mechanisms are in place for sharing the good working practices across the NHS? Because sometimes management are slow to adapt or uh, take change on board. One of the, yeah, that's a fair point. One of the um, important parts of this bill is because you put this approach on that statutory basis, and it then uh, is part of the work that Health Improvement Scotland uh, do and when they're in, in uh, conducting their inspections and the care inspector when they're conducting their inspections is that you you rely less on the spread of good practice because you now have a statutory requirement um, I'm not suggesting we have statutory requirements in every area where we might want to spread good practice but I think it, it takes us uh, away from that circumstance where we're relying on good practice spreading and we're actually putting a statutory basis here for this. And that's not to suggest that people don't uh, pick up good practice uh, because they don't want to, but other things get in the way, other priorities in terms of uh, the work you're doing day to day uh, and, and things that will take priority, for example, are your statutory duties. And so putting this uh, onto that legislative framework um, gives it greater robustness and force in terms of what needs to happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can, can I just seek some clarification around some of those points around, uh, around that? <coughs> First of all, is it still the intention that boards would be required to report on the application of the tools? 
rather than necessarily the outcomes of the common staffing methods in, in, in terms of uh, future staffing numbers and so on. So is, is it specifically on the application, whether or not the tools have been properly applied, that boards would be reporting? Yeah, no, it's not. It's We expect boards to report on not only the application of the tools, but the outcomes. Okay. And we would expect Health Improvement Scotland and their inspections to be looking at that. Excellent. And would Health Improvement Scotland, in order to do that, would they have powers and the ultimate sanctions parallel to those which we've heard of uh, that are available to the care inspectorate where they are able to take fairly uh, significant uh, measures where well, uh, uh, commitments are not fulfilled? Yeah, well, in their, in their inspection role, Health Improvement Scotland have uh, a number of powers already uh, in terms of how they inspect uh, under that role, and they would continue to have those, obviously, in this area. They also have an important improvement function, though, yep. uh, so they have a, a, a role and a responsibility that where uh, standards are not being met uh, and duties not being complied with to uh, offer uh, improvement support to allow people to improve uh, and meet those standards or uh, fulfil those duties. Uh, and then, of course, there are other steps uh, should that then subsequently not happen. And what would a board, what would you expect a health board to do if it applied the statutory obligations contained in the bill and found that it wasn't able to meet all of those uh, uh, requirements that were put upon them as a consequence? So sh should a board um, be uh, using the tools and uh, as a consequence of that and the application of professional judgment not be able to fill the roles, I think is what you're asking. Essentially, yeah. um, Well, I'd expect the board to be doing two things. I'd expect the board to be very speedily informing me or informing uh, government of that uh, and discussing with us uh, what alternative solutions there might be in those circumstances and uh, working with us to see if we can resolve it in the medium to longer term. And I'd expect government in terms of, or the health department in terms of workforce planning to be taking note of that and making taking a view as to whether that was a particular set of local circumstance or something that we were seeing uh, evidenced as a trend in a particular area of skills or expertise. Thank you very much. Emma Harper. Thank you. Just a couple of additional questions about care homes and care inspectorate. In the policy memorandum, uh, Paragraph 84 through 90 talks about care inspectorate and uh, um, on the care side. It says that the bill sets out a mechanism to develop tools and methodology for care homes for adults in the first instance. And the bill, the legislation does not seek to prescribe an approach to workload or workforce planning on the face of the bill in care service settings, but rather to enable the development of suitable approaches for different settings. I know concerns have been raised about... Uh, staffing in care homes and how it's really difficult to recruit for care homes and that's it was one of the um, comments was said that it's already at the bottom line in terms of resource for providing the service so I'm interested in to know what efforts are underway to address the concerns of the care sector and the risks of any consequences because of the challenges in recruitment uh, at the moment. So, uh, I understand the concerns that uh, the care sector um, raises. It, I think it would be inaccurate to say that, that is, uh, those, are con those are concerns that are evidence-based across the entirety of our country. I think we have other um, parts where care homes are successfully recruiting and recruiting at uh, a significant level uh, to, uh, to meet their needs. Um, there are a number of initiatives already underway to try and ensure that we have um, uh, the availability uh, of staff for care homes. Some of that is, is around care homes working in clusters where, for example, they may uh, have need for allied health professionals in terms of occupational therapy or um, physical therapy, um, but they can share that staff resource uh, in other parts um, I know in, uh, one, uh, in one local authority at least, uh, where they are as a local authority having reorganized their services, uh, but having a, a policy position of no compulsory redundancies, offering retraining opportunities while still employed by the local authority 
to staff who want to uh, retrain in order to take up opportunities in both care homes and childcare. Um, the other uh, initiatives I spoke about in terms of the articulation between school and college and higher education uh, work, and um, particularly focused on both young people but also uh, on adult returners uh, in local <coughs> settings. There are often opportunities that are possible uh, for uh, women to return to work um, and to do that in the care home setting and of course our, our application of the uh, living wage um, to care home workers um, was, is an important element of making care, care work, care home work um, attractive to people. I don't know if either Fiona or Diana want to add to that. And I think we are working with the Scottish Care, we're working with the you know, Royal College of Nursing, other stakeholders, so my, my, my team are, are leading that work with other government colleagues so that we can enhance the, the nursing contribution into care homes and almost define it as to how, how it would be. So recognising that in, in some areas it can be a challenge, but some of the practical issues about um, supporting people who are care workers within care homes to do the nurse training the way we, we've done in the NHS for some time as as well as other wider work of looking at how we support uh, care home staffing in general. Thank you. Thank you very much. Finally, uh, Cabinet Secretary, I know that work is going ahead jointly with COSLA under part two of the National Workforce Plan uh, simply to uh, ask if you are satisfied that there is no a contradiction uh, between uh, the requirements of the bill and the work that's undergoing under underway already, uh, and and that there will be no disruption to that joint working that's being done around the national workforce plan. I, I am satisfied that there would be there will be no disruption to that joint work. The joint work is really important, but I'm also um, uh, confident that the um, should this bill become legislation, that it will significantly contribute to robust workforce planning uh, across health and social care. Thank you very much. And can I thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for your attendance this morning with your officials. Uh, I will now suspend for two minutes uh, uh, in order to allow the panel to leave.
are still in public session and we are looking now at the European Union Withdrawal Act uh, measures. Uh, this is a further proposal from the Scottish Government to consent to UK Government legislation using the powers under the Withdrawal uh, Act in relation to three separate instruments. The Human Tissue Quality and Safety for Human Application Amendment, EU Exit Regulations, the Quality and Safety of Organs Intended for Transplantation Amendment, EU Exit Regulations, and the Blood Safety and Quality Amendment, EU Exit Regulations. Uh, members will have seen the note from the clerks, which uh, uh, identifies that each of these regulations uh, is, is identified by the Scottish Government as following, falling under Category B. Most of the content is technical and minor, but they do um, involve uh, uh, matters where we may wish to take evidence on the notification uh, from the Scottish Government and potentially from external stakeholders. Colleagues will recognise that these orders relate, these regulations relate to matters which we will be considering in great detail uh, in the, uh, after the October recess, so there is a, 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 a relevance there as well. The letter from uh, Joe Fitzpatrick states that he requires a reply within 28 days, but that does not include the 14 days of the recess, so we have until uh, the 10th of November. Therefore, uh, although this paper only reached us on Friday, I suggested we uh, have it on the agenda today so that we can make a decision today as to whether we want to uh, uh, obtain some evidence before approving or otherwise these regulations. Uh, Sandra. Thank you very much, Kivira. Yeah, I've, I've looked at the basically suggestions about you know writing and, and having people in to, to answer questions. I'm really quite concerned. Uh, in regards to the contents mm -hmm. here. Um, when you look at human tissue, yeah. blood transplant, what's happened, I'm not going to get into the whole thing. I, thought, I know that's for questioning, but I do think it's imperative that we do have an evidence session. You're, you're talking here on various things which has um, got um, far-reaching consequences as far as I'm concerned, so I think we do need an evidence it, session on it. it. It's certainly relevant. We don't need to make that judgment today, though. I think mm -hmm. I think all we need to decide today is whether we agree to write to uh, uh, the, the, the the most interested parties, if you like, and then when we get their replies in the first meeting after the October recess, we can decide whether that is enough information or we need uh, to take further evidence. Thank you, convener. Just wanted to know what flex there was in our work plan. Should we? decide to take such evidence? There is a little. Uh, uh, clearly, after the October recess, we're running into the um, human, uh, tissue. human tissue authorization bill, which, which is pertinent in the sense that um, uh, these, these matters clearly relate to that. So, yeah. so um, given, given, given that, that convergence, it's, it's, it's possible okay. to imagine a half hour session if, if we feel on the basis of the evidence. I mean, I, I suspect uh, we should we should obtain that written evidence first before coming to any view as to whether we need to, to hear more. If members are agreeable, uh, then um, we will uh, issue correspondence to the organisations mentioned in the clerk's paper and uh, return to this at our meeting immediately after the October recess to um, consider the responses we've had. Thank you very much, and as previously agreed, we will now move into private session. <laughs>